an American Athletic Conference Defensive Player of the Year in 2016, winner of the NFL Game Changer Award as well as the NCAA Inspiration Award for overall the 141st pick in the 2018 draft at UCF, co-author of Inseparable, How Family and Sacrifice Forged a Path to the NFL. I mentioned I'm excited about this because he is a longtime friend of the show. Shaquem Griffin joins me. Shaquem, it's good to have you back. How are you? Man, I'm doing good, man. Good to talk to you again. Thanks for having me, man. Dude, it is so great to have you back. So listen, you and I, as I mentioned, go way, way back. We've been talking for years. So I had to get you on today about your announcement yesterday that you're retiring from football. How does it feel now to have made the announcement and to move on to the next phase of your life? I mean, honestly, uh, I've been telling everybody, it's, it's like more of a relief. You know, uh, I feel like a, a, a weight has been lifted oftenly because I'm able to embark on a journey that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And, you know, when it comes to retirement, it's, it's different shapes and forms of retirement in different ways and different people. So when your time comes about and it starts happening and you start receiving your flowers, you start receiving the love from your community, your team, and those around you who've been, who've been supporting you for all these years, and, you know, it, it's still kind of surreal, but it, it, it feels amazing, honestly. Like, you know, you think about how retirement would look, but when you see the fun and everything that goes with it, it's just like it's been an amazing experience. It's Shaquem Griffin joining us. I love that. I love the way you made the announcement as well. You made the announcement in the Players' Tribune, and the announcement was that you're shifting to Plan A. It's such a great line, but this was always the plan. For those who did not know, what did your father tell you and your brother that Plan A needed to be? Uh, plan A was just always just trying to help people. I mean, I feel like that was something that, that was the pinnacle in our life with comes to me and my brother and our uh, family members. My mom was in the medical field. My dad used to help people. So, you know, it was always a way to how can we help some help better somebody else that's, that's in need. And it wasn't, no matter if it was motivational speaking, if it was us becoming doctors, if it was us becoming physicians, no matter what, we always had plans of helping people. But now you're trying to put it in motion and seeing ways that you can motivate, inspire, and help. And now it's just executing it. You know, you write about the fact that back in 2020, you and your brother Shaquille were in Seattle, and then you saw the news that you had been cut by the Seahawks. I'm curious, given how close the two of you are, what kind of emotions did you have in that moment when you saw that? I mean, um, during the cut, because uh, I've been there, I've been there, done it before, I've been cut before, and sharing that experience with my brother, I feel like it makes it easier because it kind of... Um, not only enlightens me, but it kind of reminds me of, you know, what I'm doing it for and why I started. Like, I, I started playing football because I enjoy it. I enjoy playing football with my brother. And it's not about what's happening as far as being cut because at the end of the day, work don't have to do it, no matter who does it. And that was the mindset. And that's what my brother was telling me was like, no matter what happened, we still got to put in the work. And he said, if you want your spot, go get it. And that's really what the words was. So, you know, during that past tripping when I was writing that, it was more of like, I seen the impact that me and my brother and vice versa, what we had on each other when it comes to this football game, playing from Little League, playing from high school to college to, to NFL, it's like it was the pinnacle of our success. It was the pinnacle of us getting there because we forced sacrifices for each other for us to, to, to be together and stay together. So when that time came when, you know, moving to different teams and being in different cities and being separated, you start to – to see, to feel that, you know, that's not the same. You know, that that love and that passion that you had as far as why you were doing it and who you were doing it with. And now it's like going from different teams and trying out and flying to different places. It, it wasn't the same feeling that I used to have. And, you know, being able to talk to my brother, being able to talk to guys like K.J. Wright and Bobby Wagner and having, you know, a lot of mentors and stuff, being able to kind of shape, you know, things that you want to do. And I feel like being in Seattle helped a lot because – Seeing what the guys do to help people and serve and be an active service for people, and you you see how they share a piece of themselves when they want to help, and it's just like how do I shake that for myself? And you know, as I got older, I was starting to figure that out more. And now it's coming to the point where I've been inspiring people for so long, and haven't been to the time to, to sit back and notice 
the change and the things that I really have done. Shaquem Griffin joining us. You know, I listen to that response, and the whole thing just strikes me as so uncommon. I mean, the bond between you and your brother, the love between you and your brother is so uncommon. Your mindset's always been so uncommon. You as a person, so uncommon. As a player, so uncommon. Like, for instance, the natural thing in that moment to me would be to be upset that you were cut or maybe to be upset with the way you found out. You said, quote, I was more worried about how other people would perceive me. I didn't want people think, thinking, ah, the one-handed player got cut. End of quote. You know, because you and I go back, and I know the way you think to a certain extent. You don't do sympathy. So what no. do you remember about thinking about that? And lay that out, why you don't do sympathy. Uh, because I feel like the things that I've done is something that I've been fighting for my whole life. Like, I don't I don't sympathize myself when it comes to me even have to work hard or outwork somebody. So I never wanted to be, you know, I guess, viewed in that way of, you know, I like. I know a lot of people say it's a feel good story, but this is my story. You know, I don't. I don't think that it's a. You know, a softness to it. It's a grit. It's a grind. It's a. I want this so bad. Nobody can take it from me. Type of feel. And you know, that's how I. That's how I live it. You know, people say, oh yeah, he went to the combine and he did his thing. We were so surprised. I wasn't surprised because I was. I, I was set out to do what I always going to do. If they said run fast, I was going to run fast. I, I've been bench pressing since I was a little kid. So, you know, I was prepared for that moment. It just was the world prepared to see me. And that's really that's, that's really the, the moral of the story is, like, I'm showing this. I'm showing the real me. I'm doing what I've always been doing, but now the world is starting to see it. Now, how do you view me? You know, you mentioned some of the mentors you've had. When you talk about guys like Bobby Wagner and K.J. Wright, we can talk about football. We can talk about scheme. We can talk about grit. We can talk about grind. However, a lot of what you learn from those guys is about connecting with people and then moving them and impacting them. Break that down for me. Like, in terms of those intangible things and connecting with people, what did you learn from those two? Oh, man, I, I feel like the, the putting the best words possible is just showing love. I mean, showing love for the people and wanting to put a world in a better place, no matter how big or small your part is, is always a, a is always a big part for somebody else who's watching. And, you know, watching KJ on, you know, how he build wells and bring water to people and how, you know, Bobby Widener, you know, teaches financial literacy. And, you know, a, a lot of these things is um, they're taking a piece of themselves and sharing it with people and showing how they can help. And that's something that it was an uh, insight for me because, like, how can I share a piece of myself and be able to help? And it's me literally living my truth. It's me wanting to accomplish things that I'm set out to do. It's me wanting to stay motivated no matter what people think of me. As long as I believe in myself, I can do that. How can I share this with people to, to, to have that mindset? As long as you believe in yourself, everything else is, 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 is up for you. You know, your family believes in you. You got coaches that believe in you. You have loved ones that loves and believes in you. Now, only thing we're missing is you believing in yourself to go accomplish what you set out to do. And right. when you got guys around you who can re remind you and show this over and over and display it, it's like, now how can I apply this to my life? See, Shaq, the, th the thing it seems to me is you've always been like this. Going back to the first time you and I spoke when you were at UCF, I've heard from so many people how you've inspired them. And now you have this message that you can share with schools and colleges. You even present to companies. It just seems like you've always had that deep, deep-rooted belief in yourself. What if somebody listening right now doesn't have that belief? What if they don't have that confidence? What if they've never had that confidence? What is your message to those folks? And then how do they get that confidence? I mean, the best way to get that confidence is sometimes you really just got to sit back and think. Um, sit and think. Think about those who care about you, either if it's your mom, it's your dad, it's your your siblings, it's if it's a friend or a mentor of yours. Think about those who believe in you and why they think and why you think they believe in you, and then start to apply that to yourself. You know, it's an everyday practice. You're not going to just get it in one hour. You know, it's every day you have to wake up and believe that I can do this. You got to wake up and believe I can do this. You're going to get them days where it's really hard. And even then, that's when you got to emphasize it on the more. I can believe, I believe I can do this. And then it's taking the steps to do so. I feel like it's a it's a mindset that's easy can be said, but it's harder to do. And like I said, every day it, it, it takes practice to believe in oneself. You know, if you set out to do something, don't give up because somebody else said that you couldn't do it. That should make you more hungry to go accomplish it more. And you're figuring it out. And thing is, you got to be able to take that leap of faith. And I know people hear it all the time. Like I said, it's easier to say stuff than actually apply it to your life. Once you hear it more than enough, you are starting to apply bits and pieces to it, you know, such as myself. 
And you got to be able to take that, that 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 leap of faith because sometimes um, I'm pretty sure a lot, a lot of people heard it before. You know, saying you you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. So if you're not gonna go out for it, then what's the point of it all? You know, just go for it. You may fail, but there's nothing wrong with failing because with each fail comes closeness to uh, success. So you got to keep going after it. You ain't gonna win it all, but as soon as you keep going and keep going. Around the corner, it's, it's, it's a peace of mind and a goal that you've been fighting for your whole life for. So why not? So why stop? Yeah, why be afraid to fail? The biggest failure is not even trying. I still love this notion that football was plan B and that what you're on to right now is plan A. There have been so many amazing things that have happened to you. You were even named Godfather of Margaritaville <laughs> at Sea Paradise. My man, exactly what is that? Lay that out for me. What is that about? Um, the godfather of the uh, Margaritaville cruise ship was uh, <laughs> was a major blessing. I was able to cut the uh, the red ribbon to open up a new cruise line, and being the godfather of it was that's my first time. So it was it, it, it was a, a very blessing and a cool experience because you know you walk around a, a cruise ship and you getting called godfather by everyone. You know it, it, it starts to stick to you a little bit. <laughs> so I mean being able to. You know, be a part of that. And I remember just coming from UCF, a lot of UCF investors, a lot of UCF guys was, you know, bringing my name up. Like, who's the guy in Florida that can represent this ship the right way, the positivity, you know, being motivated. Like, a lot of a lot of people was down that the cruise ship could come. Like, you know, Margaritaville is known for food and drinks and resorts. Like, how can we bring this ship? And people are like, oh, you can't do a ship and then bring it to life and make it happen. Like, who can represent us? And being that guy that they called, I trust me, I was surprised when they did it. But once I once I seen what they was doing, once I seen the ship and where they came from and how they was building it and how they set their team up, it's like I'm pretty sure they had a lot of people who was doubting them from finishing it, but they got it done and it was a blessing to see it. And uh, extreme blessings to have me a part of it, being the godfather for the ship to release it to the I, waters. I was going to say, dude, you are the godfather. You earned that for sure. And finally, you were asked by Roger Goodell to join the NFL Legends community. What was that moment like for you, and how does it feel to be included in that group, and what will you do for them? I mean, it's, with Roger Goodell and, and being a part of the Legends group, man, I, it, it was an extreme blessing because, you know, being the youngest legend, I didn't know, you know, the impact I can make for them and being able to sit down with them and kind of understand what I actually can do for them and being that, that younger face that people can relate to and people can help. And I can be mentors for players coming in, players playing, and players leaving. And, like, you have that direct access to understanding. And, you know, you got these legends who, you know, who's been out of the league for 20 or 20-plus 20 years. And, you know, you get these young guys that don't even know some of the legends. Sometimes, and I feel like the diversity that he's bringing is bringing that that younger generation to say, you know what, we all can help each other because this is a brotherhood, and the only way we're gonna be able to help our brotherhood out is we protect each other. And like, how can we do that? I was like, with a lot of things that we've been taught as players, that's relatable to no matter if you're a young or old player or retired player or legend, that we've been taught to be. You know, to have grit, we were taught to be machines. We were taught to be like, you got to be crazy to do this game or, you know, you got to leave everything on the outside and you got to be able to just stay tough all the time. But in reality is that's that's not realistic because all of us are human no matter if we play playing sports or not. And it's like, how do we reshape that mindset from being where it's like old school, you know, early 1900s football to now? You know, we got to support each other. We are, we are a family when it, when it comes out there. We got to protect each other mentally and physically. And I feel like the physical point is there with trainers, but mentally we don't have that surface where it's like it's okay not to be okay. And how can we help you to become a better you? You got to release some of that bad stuff before you can let the good stuff in for you to become a better player, a better man, a better husband, or wherever you, or wherever the case may be. It's such a great point. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay, especially in a culture where you're brought up, that sport where it's not okay, but it is okay not to be okay. He yeah. is a player that was now American. He played four years in the NFL. He's co-author of Inseparable, How Family and Sacrifice Forged a Path to the NFL. Long time friend of the program, and now it's on to plan A. Shaq, congratulations. So great to have you on the show, and let's do it again soon. It was great to get caught up. Man, thank you so much, man. It's always good talking to you, man. I appreciate you so much. My guy, appreciate right. you. Next call, you know you got me. Yeah, I love that, man. Appreciate you so much, Shaq. Nothing but love and respect.